Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. This is special for me in so many ways. There's a lot of people who I recognize who are here, and there's some people who I don't know, and I look forward to meeting every one of you. I'm going to speak about a topic this afternoon on something that I really have a sincere passion and interest in. And it started way back when, like many of you who had this desire to be the best soccer player you could be. I grew up in Long Island, about 40 miles from here, trained every day and thought that my career would be in soccer as a player. And I was fortunate enough to play at Columbia University, Division I team, ranked in the nation. And during my college years, I decided that my ultimate career would be to serve soccer players. And that would be become a sports medicine doctor and take care of injured soccer players and keep their dream alive. So I'm 17 years into practice, and what I do is I fix ACLs and soccer players and get, that back, get them back on the field. And during this time period of my journey, I was fortunate enough to become the head team physician for our New York City Football Club. And I've had this incredible privilege of taking care of some of the most elite athletes, not just in soccer, but in other domains such as baseball, and I've been able to compare what it takes to become a surgeon who can perform at the highest levels with those athletes that perform at the highest levels. And it's become clear that these principles that get you to the highest levels are universal and they can be applied to any domain. So the first thing I'd like you to appreciate along with me is that being good at something, whatever it is, being a coach, being a parent, playing the violin is probably one of the deepest sources of fulfillment. And that's our quest. We always want to get better and be better than we were yesterday. And this concept of skill that we all appreciate, that we talk about all the time, is getting better at something through training. And then there's this concept of mastery. And that's when you have a deep, profound knowledge and that particular subject matter that you apply along with your skill to be far beyond anybody else in your technical expertise. And many of us see experts on a daily basis. And we see jaw-dropping moments when an athlete does something special, and we don't relate to it as something that we can do. It's just too phenomenal what this athlete or what this performer can do. And we say they must be gifted. If I could only be gifted like them, I'm going to argue otherwise. The first concept of achieving mastery is not believing in innate talent. It's understanding that getting great at something comes through a process. And if you consider one of the greatest golfers of our generation, Tiger Woods, his father, Earl Woods, was a military tactics teacher. This guy could teach. He played high school sports. He was on his second marriage, and he had time to devote to his son, Tiger. So at seven months, Tiger had a putter in his hand at two years of age. He was practicing on a golf course. At age four, he had his own professional coach. And by the time he was 19, and we thought of him as an elite athlete, he already had 17 years of intense training towards his craft of playing golf. Now, I'm 17 years into practice right now. He was 19 when he had 17 years of his practice. Chess is something amazing. Chess is a model for studying how you can get good at something. There's a gentleman, his name is Laszlo Polger, and he has a concept. His concept is that if he has children, he can develop them into the best chess players in the world. And he wants to test that hypothesis. So he needs children. That was the hard part for him. He advertises the experiment in an effort to get a spouse that might uh, help him with this effort of having children and testing this hypothesis, and he gets a taker. He gets a woman to be his wife and to have kids, and they have three kids. And as you can predict, they become the number one and number two women chess players in the world. In fact, Judith, the youngest, she becomes the youngest grandmaster in the history of all chess, and she beats Bobby Fischer at the age of 15 by a few months. This doesn't just apply to sports and chess and music. We all know this gentleman. His training starts at the age of three. His first masterpiece is at the age of 21. He has 18 years of training. There's something about the training and there's something about the environment. This is a tennis club outside of Moscow. This tennis club has two tennis courts. 
These two tennis courts create more ranked female tennis players in the world than the entire United States. Two tennis courts. There's a lovely book. There's an Englishman who plays table tennis. And he describes in England the best tennis, table tennis players came from the same street. All different backgrounds, all different everything. There's something about the environment. And we think of this as being skill and we're good. We can throw it, we can kick it, we can move it, we can do it. But really it comes down to decision making. And it's true of surgery. And I saw this sign walking through a surgical exposition. And for orthopedic surgeons, split second decisions take years of practice. Everyone in this room understands this concept of 10,000 hours. We've heard of it. It's talked about all the time. I'm going to tell you what it really comes down to. 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours really comes down to do it four hours a day. Do it four hours a day and do it for 50 weeks a year and do it for 10 years, and then you can be an expert at it. The reason why this became so popular is because Malcolm Gladwell, the writer, put it in his book, Outliers. But the person who studied it, his name is Anders Ericsson. And the way he conceived of this is he looked at the best violinists in the world at a music uh, at a music institution, and he found that the best practiced 10 hours, and when you went further in your accomplishments, you basically just uh, practiced less. So this concept now is applied to everything. You want to be better at selling something, you want to be better at driving a car, it comes down to the amount of time. But in actuality, it's not just time, and I'm going to convince you of that. It's not just time, it's what you do with that time and how you practice. I don't play a lot of chess. I'm studying chess. I don't play a lot of it. I'm studying it because I find chess an amazing process to learn how people can get excellent at something. This is my son. He goes to a school right here in Manhattan, same school as David Villa. He sees David Villa every day. He's too shy to say hi to him. He plays chess. The school has a big emphasis on chess. This is a scholastic chess tournament. This is the New York State Scholastic Chess Tournament. It's in a hotel just in Midtown, and he goes and he plays in the tournament. And part of the process of playing in a tournament is you write every move down, and you write your opponent's move down. Here's his list of moves. In fact, he has a book. He archives every game he ever plays. And after the game, every move is analyzed with his chess coach. Move one, e4, second move by the opponent, e5, knight f6. And as they go through the moves, the coach will tell the student if it's a good move, great move, a blunder, you put your queen at risk, and it gets analyzed compared to a master. Now, this is a process that's applied in a lot of fields, and it's applied in medicine. When we train surgeons how to do surgery, how to make a diagnosis, the process goes like this. Student goes into the room, sees a patient, hi, I'm the student, tell me about your problem, they examine the, the patient, they come out, and they tell me what the diagnosis is. And then I go through the process. I may give them the sign that it was a blunder. I may give them the sign that it was a great move. And then we review it. And this goes on and on and on for about 10 years until they get to their level of achievement. I run what's called a surgical techniques conference. You know about surgeons. Surgeons, they do things. They operate. And getting good at this thing about operating takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, and it means not making mistakes. So learning outside of the operating room where mistakes are not tolerated is important. We do what's called a surgical techniques conference. Every Friday, I have a young surgeon in training describe a surgery in detail where we go through the process. I know there's not surgeons in the room, but this is what it would be like. They show a picture during a surgical repair like this. And I may stop them and say, this exposure doesn't allow you to see the problem. What could you do to make the exposure, the ability to see it better? And they'll say something like, I'll put more instruments in. I'll put a retractor in. That's what retractors do. They allow you to see it. And I say, where are you going to put the retractor? And they say, I'm going to put it right on the radius bone. And then I say something like blunder. Because if you put it on the radius bone, and this is a retractor here, this is a nerve right here. And if you put it there, you will paralyze the nerve. And for a person having elbow surgery, it means they can't lift their wrist up. We discover this before it happens in the operating room, and we stop it from happening. This is what training is in environments that are so intense that has no ability to have mistakes happen. 
This is called counterfactual simulation. It's mentally hard. We're saying, think about what could happen. It's extremely challenging. Marshall Chess Club, anybody heard of it? It's about a mile from here. It's in the village. It's a brownstone, it's a building. It's one of the most famous chess clubs on planet Earth. It's because some of the best players in the world have played there, they've trained there. I've gone there. This is Magnus Carlsen in the picture. He's considered the best chess player in the world right now. He hangs out the Marshall Chess Club. This is Washington Square Park. That's my photo. I was closer when I went to take the photo and this guy said 10 bucks for a photo. So I took a step back. They usually play for 20 bucks, winner takes 20 bucks. We think of chess players as having ridiculous IQs. They can remember anything. They can project moves. They can calculate, right? I mean, they're way above average in IQ. I'm gonna show you guys something. The best chess players, they have average IQs. They have average IQs. You know how we know? Look at this experiment. This experiment is 40 years old. You take a bunch of masters and you pick a bunch of novices and you give them a chess board. You have pieces on them and you let them see the board for a few seconds. And then you ask them to recreate the board where the pieces were. The novices are not that good. They only get a few of the pieces, maybe five on average. And the masters get every one of them instantly. Second part of the experiment is that the pieces get placed randomly. They don't look like a chess game. They're just on the board in any random fashion. Maybe you put the piece upside down. If you ask them to recreate the pieces now, the expert are as good as the novices. In fact, when they redo these experiments, the experts are worse than the novices because they're so confused about the setup that they get frustrated and they can't even do it. The novices even beat them. The reason is, Expert chess players who've been playing chess for long periods of time, they have these libraries of positions. They know things that they have in their memory banks. Inexperienced players are the ones who calculate every move. They try to calculate. Advanced chess players have what we call pattern recognition. They've seen it before. This is Magnus Carlsen again. He's doing what's called blindfold chess. All the guys behind them think they're gonna win. They actually don't think, they know they're gonna lose. He's gonna keep 10 chess games in his head and not even look at the board, and he's gonna beat every one of them. That was ridiculous, right? Who can do this? This guy, Alexander Alakine, in 1924, right here in New York City, played 26 games blindfolded simultaneously. There's 26 boards, it's a million pieces, it's a gazillion combinations. And how did he learn about this and then it became popular? Now, he's a Russian playing in the New York uh, area and then 19, four, uh, at the time in 1914 he was playing in Germany. He's playing a tournament, war breaks out, and then Germany keeps all these Russian players captive. There's about 10 of them. And while they're captive, they decide to play each other without boards. They just mentally visualize the board and they play moves based on the designation of the board and they can get through games and during all their time of captivity. Uh, this mental process is amazingly hard. Think about what you would do mentally just to do some of your tasks. So what happens is these elite grandmasters, they see a collection of chunked information. They have libraries and they know how these interact with each other and they see the board differently than the novice like myself and they instantly see weaknesses and they see strengths and they know what to do. I think you know where I'm getting at with this. Surgeons do this, soccer players do this. Soccer players who are good at this game, they see the game differently than the weak players. We think of them as kicking, controlling the ball better. What they're doing in many ways is they see the game player, see the game better. All right, this kid's eight. All these guys are master uh, chess players. He's beaten them all, this poor guy. He knows he's lost already. This guy's using intimidation tactics. This is Bobby Fischer. Everybody's heard of Bobby Fischer. It's about 40 games going on. He'll either win or draw all of these games, and these are all accomplished chess players. Uh, I told you, this is ridiculous, right? I do a lot of teaching and surgery. I teach people how to do ACL reconstructions, for example. And this is a teaching facility that I teach at. And every one of these students are at a station. And I walk around every one of these stations and I look at where they are in the position of their surgical reconstruction on a cadaver, and I make adjustments. 
And in fact, when these chess players, because their libraries are so strong, when they get back to the board and make their next move, if a guy cheated, they know it right away because it doesn't make sense to them. They know the guy cheated. That's how strong they are at this. All right, chunking is a big deal. That means we take groups of information and we put them together so they're no longer singular. This is my son's uh, project at school. He's learning how to chunk information through artwork. So here we go, novice players, people are new to this game of soccer, they think it's chaos. Kids are all running around and things are happening and I, it doesn't make sense to me. The experts, there's no such thing as chaos. They see the flow of the game. They see what's happening. They see opportunities. They see areas that are weaknesses that they have to then correct or they see opportunities that they can take advantage of. I got a book over here. A lot of these concepts are in the book. I'm going to jump around to a couple and share with you, and then I'm going to uh, be happy to give each one of you guys a copy of the book. And one of these concepts is how we deal with when we don't do well, when we make excuses. I mean, we've all done it. We've all done it. I mean, the biggest excuse has to do with officiating in this game. We got a guy who supports MLS fish officiating here today. So, you guys recognize this? It's about 30 blocks north of here. This is the Intrepid aircraft carrier. It's a museum now. You guys can go visit. I visit it all the time. My kids love it. Birthday parties, everything. This is what's on top of the museum aircraft carrier. This is a F-4. This is the US military phenomenal jet that was used in the Vietnam War, and it was battling against the Russian MiG. Now, this jet was incredible. It was the fastest jet. It had this crazy gun. It had missiles that could be radar seeking or heat seeking. And it was the best piece of equipment the US military had. And the US loved being successful in wars. And in fact, the kill ratio in the air was five to 10 planes or jets to every one that they lost. It wasn't good, though, against Vietnam. Even though they were better, it was not what they were used to. And in fact, we were losing so many of these expensive jets that they shut down all military air combat moratorium. No more. During this time where there was no military combat, the Navy went through a new training process, but the Air Force stayed consistent with their training process. The Navy called it the Fighter's Weapons School, and what they did was during their exercises, they recorded everything. And when they got done with their dogfight exercises, they went into a room, they analyzed the film. And when they looked at the film, there was nothing that could be hidden from it. It was brutal honesty. And they, they would ask questions about how you could improve on your technique, and then they would go and do it again. And then they would analyze it, and they'd go and do it again. When they resumed their combat missions, not that much later, the Air Force that did not do this technique dropped. They got worse. Two to one, the Navy's ratio improved. They improved from two to one to 12 to one. That was a ridiculous amount of improvement with a simple uh, adjustment and training methods. Everybody said it was something that had to do with the people and the, uh, and the equipment they used. But in the end, it was the training. And it was the training of people. And it wasn't training their physicality. It was training their minds. You guys know what this is. This is Top Gun. You guys know what the best predictor of chess ability? I get this question a lot as a surgeon. How many of these done? Hey, you tore your ACL. It's time to fix it. Go through the process. And the legitimate question is, how many of these have you done? I've done a lot. I've done more than people I know. We think that's equated with being good at it. So if you think people who are good at chess probably has to do with how many chess games they played. You want to know what the best predictor of chess ability is? It's not the amount of time they play. It's the number of games they've analyzed. It's not how much you play. It's how much you analyze the games you've played. And it doesn't even have to be your games. It could be other people's games that you analyze. Here's a group from England that does some research in soccer. They showed kids film, soccer, matches going on, and then they stopped the film, and a play is going on. 
and they asked these kids, hey, what happened next? What would be the best move to do in this situation? And as you could predict, the kids who were really good, they could predict what was gonna happen next. The kids that were not as good, they couldn't predict what was gonna happen next. In fact, you can do some training sitting down and watching film that's pretty exceptional if you think of soccer as something that we have to improve our minds because we got the ability to gain touch figured out in some ways. Okay, I'm gonna break this down into some smaller uh, pieces now and it has to do with some concept that was brought up by this gentleman, Dan Coyle, who became a friend of mine during this whole process of writing this book and he shares uh, many of these same thoughts and principles. And this concept of practice and how we practice may be the real talent. Not the talent you see demonstrated, but the talent for practice. I was an engineer in college. Engineering, we break things and we study how materials work. And this concept of strain in an engineering sense is we take material and we stretch it. That's what strain is. The thing got stretched. Time, we know what that is, and the sense of time when it comes to these things we're talking about is experience. How many did you do? How long have you been doing it for? Got to get a guy with gray hair if he's going to be good at it. But experience alone does not equal achievement. You guys know John Wooden, and he is probably the most accomplished coach on this earth in the last century. He won 88 collegiate basketball games in a row, had 10 NCAA titles. It'll never, be, it'll never be reproduced. I'm going to tell you what this means. What does practice mean? This is my map getting from where I stay in the summer to our game facility, Yankee Stadium. Looks like 58 minutes. It's me using GPS or Waze or using the navigation. One day I plugged in NAV, I was about to head to the stadium, the same route that I've taken hundreds of times, literally hundreds of times. And the thing was broken, wasn't working. Couldn't get it on my phone, didn't have uh, maps, I didn't have anything on my phone. I could not get to the stadium. Done it a hundred times, couldn't get there. Didn't know where to turn, I didn't know, I was so uncomfortable, I was sweating. The reason is just because we've done it a number of times, if we haven't pushed ourselves, if we haven't really thought about what we're doing, we're not gonna get better, and it's the same with how we train our young athletes, and especially when we don't let kids figure it out on their own, it's the stretching that is really important. So it's the strain, it's the discomfort, it's the stretch with time that equals skill. That's the equation. You can do something for a long time, and if you don't stretch yourself, years are gonna go by, and you're gonna say, man, I'm not any better at this. And in fact, people get worse. Doctors get worse with time. Accountants get worse with time if they're not stretching themselves. This is what it looks like in bubbles. If you're in the comfort zone in the blue, enjoy yourself. You're not getting better. If you're in the red, you're overdoing it. You're just overdoing it. There's a sweet spot where you're stretching yourself and you're uncomfortable and you're failing maybe 60% of the time, maybe 70% of the time, and that's when you're getting better. So the process, as simple as it is, it's worth magnifying for a second. We can apply this to anything. If you want to get better at something, you got to do it a couple of times, or you got to do it a large number of times. You do the thing over and over again, but then you have to get feedback. Well, let's talk about doing it over and over and again. You know, in Brazil, they play this game, futsal. Who doesn't love this game? You know why you love it? I'd rather play this game than 11 on 11. Who wouldn't? You get to touch the ball a million times. You're involved every second with the ball. This is how you can develop skill rapidly as opposed to playing 11 on 11. Small ball, takes more skill, so many more touches. And I think you see this translate when people then go on to the big field when they got these type of skills. And of course we do this today. We create small space, we limit the number of touches, we use it in warm-up, we use it in youth and skill development. Let's talk about feedback. So you didn't do it right. Now you gotta get feedback on what wasn't right about it and then you gotta adjust. If you don't have feedback, it's like bowling with a curtain in front of you or it's like being a chef who never gets to taste his food. You just don't know how to make adjustments. The more immediate feedback is, the better it is. If you get the feedback right away, that's why dancers do it in front of a mirror you are gonna get better at it faster. 
And sometimes when you are at higher levels, you stop getting feedback. When you're the best player on the team, it's hard to get feedback. When you become the most senior person in the room, people are not giving you feedback, and suddenly you are not improving at the rate that you once were. How do you get feedback? This is the way I do it. I critique everything I do. I give myself a grade. It's not just a, ah, it wasn't so good. No, I give myself a grade, and I give it in different domains in relation to that task. So if it comes to a surgery, and I do a surgery, and I do an operation, I do maybe six or eight every Friday, six tomorrow. I'll give myself a grade on each one. And what that does, it forces self-critique. And there is a concept or a word that applies to this it's called metacognition. That's the ability to see yourself and how you're performing. And the top performers, no matter what the domain is, have a superior ability to critique themselves. Honest feedback may be the most important thing that we can have, and it's becoming more and more appreciated. It's even how people are hiring new candidates to join their workforce. Do they have this ability of having self-awareness? I started my youngest son, this is my daughter. My daughter um, loves her yearbook, and she loves it. She looks at all the kids in the yearbook. In fact, I gotta rip it out of her hands before she goes to bed. At night, she's not going to bed until I rip the thing out of her hands. She just won't go to sleep. So, <laughs> I started looking at it. I mean, what is it about the yearbook that's so crazy that you can't put it down? Anyway, I found this thing. It goes like this. If you give someone a fish, you can feed them for a day. You heard this. If you teach them how to fish, you can feed them forever. These are the kids putting their little quotes in the yearbook. Well, this one touched me. It touched me because we don't want to just give people feedback. We want to teach them how to give themselves feedback because then that loop becomes vicious and they will get better much faster. If someone asks me, and I'm going to change topics a little bit here, what is the biggest thing that I do that separates me from someone else who I don't find improving as fast as they might? It has to do with this. It has to do with mental preparation. And I've been talking about it a fair amount. I keep coming back to it. It has to do with mental practice. We think we don't have the right facility. We think the room is too small. We think the carpet's too slick. We think the temperature is too cold. But really, what we should be thinking about is how hard we're practicing with our head. So as a famous violin teacher, he says, if you practice with your fingers, you need all day. You practice with your mind, you need about a half hour. And in the operating room, people who are really good at it, they rehearse the surgery in advance in their mind, and then when they do the surgery, it acts like it's already been done before. In the world of golf, Jack Nicholas has said, I have never taken a swing that I haven't mentally rehearsed. Here is a musician that we all are aware of. Even in the field of music, you can rehearse in your mind without having to have the instrument in your hand, and you can come up with better ability to solve problems. This is a uh, extremely famous neurosurgeon who operates on brains, and he said, I visualize every day the procedure I'm going to do prior to the surgery for that feature that we spoke about. And that is making it easier like you're doing it for the second time. Okay, well maybe you don't believe me. Hey, you're not, I don't believe you. This thing about mental rehearsal, I don't get it. Give me, give me the ball. But check out some of this research. If you do what's called a meta-analysis, that is if we pool all the research ever done on doing mental preparation, it says that you can get two-thirds the benefits of actual physical preparation. And in the world of surgery or flying a plane where there's zero tolerance to making a mistake, this could be the most valuable thing that you have, and that is mental preparation. Athletes do it of all sorts. In the Olympics, at least 90% of our US athletes do it, and they say it works. And these are the people that are winning gold medals. These are the people that are at the top of their game. All right, I'm gonna finish with this last piece, and this is what really, really gets me. This is the magic. This is when you see somebody do something and you say, I gotta rewind that. I mean, I can't believe what just happened. I gotta rewind that. That's when you text somebody and you say, get ESPN on. You're not gonna believe what you just saw. Let me start with this. This is an ugly statue. This ugly statue 
sold for about $9 million in the 70s or the 80s at the Getty Museum in LA. Because it's this old historic statue, 6th century BC, and that's what they do. They put in statues for big money so everybody can see it. But this thing's got to be vetted out before it gets sold. So the museum curators did all the testing. They looked at it, they took a sample of the stone, they checked the age, they checked everything, and after a full year of vetting it out, they cut a check for it, $9 million. Then they put it on display, promote it, people come to watch it. People who walked in who were experts looked at it and said, oh my God, it is a fake. It is a fraud, just like that. And when they were asked, how can you say that? They said, I just know. How do they just know? I'm going to tell you how. There's something about this improvisation where people just do it without thinking. When you see Pirlo in trouble and it looks like it could be a problem, he's going to give up the ball and then we're going to be in a defensive compromise. And instead, instead of losing the ball, he threads a needle and it's somebody's going a goal and instead it's a goal scoring opportunity. We say that's incredible and we don't understand how he can do it. I'm going to share with you a play that happened in Yankee Stadium. This is considered the eighth best play in the history of all of Yankee plays. Now, if we do the math, the Yankees have been playing over 100 years. There's been at least 5 million, probably 10 million plays. This is number eight of 10 million. Okay, so it's a playoff game. All right, that makes it more important. Guy gets a hit, and Yankees are, uh, the Yankees are def uh, playing defense. There's a guy on base at first, right corner. That's Jeremy Giambi. He's about to score. No, he doesn't score. He gets tagged out. So you guys are saying, I, I mean, 10 million plays, how could be this the best? I'm going to tell you why it's the best. This play is the best because the throw over through two cutoff men and Jeter, who plays shortstop, made his way over to the first base line and somehow anticipated that as happening. The base runner, Jeremy Giambi, had no idea that could ever happen. It didn't even slide. And the physicality of making this flip Seems like it's really great. Ah, he flips it, he's running the wrong direction. What made this amazing was his anticipation of this play. And if you ask him how he anticipated, he doesn't know. He doesn't know how he did it. We call this game sense. We call it playing unconscious. Firefighters leave burning buildings because they feel like the floor is going to drop out. And you say, how did you know that? They like just know. Josh Waitzkin played chess in this area, played in that Marshall Chess Club and trained there played in that Washington Square Park. He says intuition is the portal between the unconscious and the conscious mind. And what happens when you practice and you do it over and over again, it becomes automatic. And when it becomes automatic, it's ingrained and you don't have to think about it anymore. And then you can increase your creativity. You can increase your RAM. You can think about things better. So what distinguishes maybe a great surgeon or a great soccer player is considered how much do they have on automatic. And we call this physical genius now, but it's really mental genius. Now we think of tennis players, we just saw an amazing US Open. The novice who's not used to putting all this information watches the ball, and the expert doesn't just look and react to the ball, but the expert watches the racket. And the elite, the best tennis players, they watch the whole body, and then they anticipate where the ball is going. <clears throat> this is Jenny Finch. She's a softball player. Pat's the best softball pitcher in our time. Played at Arizona, played for the U.S. Olympic team. She throws, I don't know, maybe 65 miles an hour. Not that fast. This guy, Albert Pujol, he hits 95 mile an hour fastballs out without even working. So 
Jenny Finch says, hey, Albert, how about you and I play? I pitch to you, you see if you can hit. It's a challenge. She challenges him. Of course, he says, I'd enjoy that. You ready? She strikes him out on three pitches. The reason that he could not hit a 65 mile an hour underhand fat ball is because his library and his automatic is for overhead pitching. He could probably get there, of course, but he'd need some training. He is not trained yet to do this. She set him up. What a ruse. She got him. In fact, Alex Rodriguez was supposed to go next, and he's like, I'm out. My ankle hurts. I can't do it. All right, I'm going, to go, I'm going to finish up with a few things, and it's about coaching, because I suspect many of us are in the field of coaching and helping people that are either in a development phase get better. And as you know, there's something very fulfilling about coaching or teaching, and that's because we affect people, and that effect can go on forever. I, in, in fact, wrote an article based on some of this work, and it had something humbling to it, and that is if any of you have surgery or need surgery or have this sense of somebody in your life's going to need to get fixed up in medicine, we often ask, hey, how do you do? How do you, where do you do it? What kind of facility do you do it at? You know, we should be asking, how good's your coach? There's no such thing as coaches in surgery. The reason why coaches are so important is because part of that feedback loop is they can see you in ways that you can't see yourself. And they give you that enhanced feedback, and they give you new strategies to correct what you're doing wrong. And to date, surgeons do not have coaches, but I work in a lot of coaching atmosphere, and we actually do it at my institution. There's something ugly in sports. It is probably the ugliest thing in sports, and that is choking. And choking, by definition, by concept, is that you didn't perform well because you got anxious, nervous, you had a mental breakdown that didn't allow you to do what you normally could do well. If you had one shot, one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted, one moment, would you capture it or would you just let it slip? You guys know who said this, right? Eminem. That's right. Who said that? Eminem. That's right. I play this all the time. This guy Eminem, you may not know it. This guy Eminem, when he wrote this song, this became the number one hit. It was like the most recorded song in forever. He was asked to play it. It won the Oscars for the song. And it, it, and this guy Eminem is the number one streamed musician in Spotify. Can you believe that? His palms are sweaty, Neek's weak, arms are heavy, and there's vomit on her sweater already. What's happening in this guy is that he's choking. Choking happens in different forms. This is an extremely famous run in Jackson Hole. It's called Corbett's Coolor. A lot of femur fractures happen at this it's closed. I felt like I was going to do it. Just because it's closed doesn't mean you can't do it, by the way. I'm going to show you. Go right up to it. It doesn't look that intimidating here. In real life, it's pretty intimidating. What happens is the heart's radiant. You're getting anxious. You're getting nervous. And so if you panic and get this nervous feeling, you get this fight or flight or freeze response. So. I got this from Phil Jackson. He knows he's in trouble if he checks his pulse at times of where decisions matter and it's going up. My pulse was ridiculous right here. Um, you should probably reconsider your decision making. I was completely by myself, nobody around. This rock right on the left, if you hit that rock, that's where your femur breaks. Being by yourself, broken femur, I, um, I changed my mind. I thought I would do some practice first. This is what could be called a Corbett simulator. This is a little baby thing. It's actually pretty hard. All right, this is my son. I just, uh, I'm standing behind him. You can't see me. You see that little guy? And I said to him beforehand, hey, buddy, you're going to get speed, and you're going to get nervous. Whatever you do, just think of one thing. Loose. Mantra is loose. Don't tighten up. Just keep your legs loose. Because if you tighten up, you're going to get stiff. You're not going to hit the chop well, and you're going to explode. He's like, I got it. He goes down, and um, chop, 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 chop. He allows me to show this. He gave me permission. He got up. He was fine. What happens uh, with that type of choking, that's a freeze response. You can't think clearly. 
That's different than this type of choking. The Greg Norman 1996 Masters. We talked about getting things on automatic. We want to make it automatic. We want to do it without even have to thinking about it. But in times of pressure, and we want to not make a mistake, and then we start thinking about it, brains don't like it. We should be putting without thinking, or we should be ball striking in golf without thinking. But once you start thinking about it and say, I better not pull this thing, then you start to deconstruct the automatic process and everything breaks down. So how do we deal with choking? And choking happens in the operating room all the time. I mean, it happens more than you think. There's methods to do it. We have pre-shot routines. We recreate pressure situations so when we see it, it's not that we've been there for the first time. If we're going to be a penalty kick taker, uh, we should be practicing those penalties under extreme stress. Anybody can score when everybody's hanging out in the, uh, and they left the training field. You should be doing things where you have extreme stress, like you shock yourself if you miss or something. That gives you the anxiety to perform well, so then you don't have that anxiety left. Typical pre-shot routine. You know, uh, Jack Nicholas with his pre-shot routine, his entire career, it was within a half a second if you timed it for his entire career. Not off by like two seconds or his margin was so exact it was like half a second. I do this in the operating room all the time. If I don't like what's happening, I'm about to start an ACL or a Tommy John surgery and I don't like what's happening, things aren't good, it's like there's somebody in the room who I don't know or the, the, that equipment I don't use. I'll say, I don't like what's going on and I start over again. I'm leaving, get it right, I'll be back in two minutes. John helps me in the operating room. He's seen me do it. So here's something that uh, is true of all of us, and it's true in the operating room as well, and it's true on the soccer field. Sometimes you don't have your game on. Sometimes your touch isn't where you want it to be. Sometimes you just don't have it that day. But the greatest players, somehow they play great, even if they don't have it that day. You've got to overcome it. You can't just say, ah, today, bad day. No way. If you don't have it that day, you've got to figure something else out. You've got to play more physical if your technical is not working. So I'm going to finish with this. And every one of you uh, have, uh, have, please, after we have a little discussion, any questions you want, please help yourself to one of these books. And this is taken from my book. This is what I wrote. The difference between the expert performer and the rest of the world, it reflects lifelong passion and a deliberate effort to improve performance in that specific domain. And the path is clear. It's long and demanding, and that's why few will follow it. And anyone and everyone who has achieved skill has encountered terrible difficulties along the way, and there are no exceptions. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. And if there are people who wanted to uh, talk about injuries and sports and general or soccer specific injuries, somebody's knees hurting, I can answer that too. Luca, you got a question? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. How do you still, so you've been in practice for 17 years, how do you still manage to strain yourself? Like I, I can't imagine like much surprises you come. Well, I, I think that Number one is a brilliant question. If everybody hasn't heard it, he says, if you've been practicing for 17 years, how do you keep developing ways to make yourself uncomfortable? There's a number of ways. First, in general, in medicine, medicine is always changing and evolving. So it's unique maybe to medicine than other fields. But I'll just tell you what my life is like. The surgery that I did 10 years ago or 15 years ago does not resemble the surgery I do now. And that's part of the reasons why we're drawn to medicine for people who are surgeons, is because it's always moving, evolving, greater technology, greater instruments. And in fact, one of my missions is to always be developing new technology and new surgeries. So the surgical techniques, some of them I've developed on my own, or some that I've adopted, or some I've taken from, say, a knee operation, and have I applied those techniques into the elbow or some other area. The most humbling experience in, in order to make yourself better as a general way, if you feel like you're getting stale, is recognize that there are people that are better than you at all the time. So for surgeons, one, if you do want to get better, 
You just gotta, one, expose yourself to somebody who's better than you, and then you get humbled and you say, man, I thought I was good. And for the last five years, I haven't been doing it the right way. And the second is, make sure you keep exposing yourself to other people. And the second is, if you ever teach somebody who's not as good as you, you think you're just imparting to them and making them better, 100% they're making you better. Because they ask you questions while you're doing it. They're asking you questions like, hey, why is it taking so long? You're like, whoa, I guess it is taking so long. Maybe I should be doing things a little quicker. And what happens is you have feedback, you have exchange, and you have thought processes about it. And then there's a whole bunch of other strategies. They're actually in the book. Anytime you think you're good at it, put new constraints on yourself. Do it in a smaller space. An example would be in soccer. Luca's playing soccer, and he's taking balls. He's getting fed balls, and he's striking. He's like, turn, strike, turn, strike, turn, strike. He's, he's magic. All you got to do is put somebody next to him and just touch him with their finger, and now he can't strike. Just got to keep increasing the pressure, whatever it is. And then it goes, we can talk about it on and on, but in surgery and other domains, it's not just a singular person oftentimes, and I, just for time, I can't go into uh, some of the other things that I find extremely interesting. It's how your team works together. And there is infinite ways to can continue to increase how the team functions together, like a NASCAR pit crew. So none of us do sports in isolation. There are some, some sports that are in isolation. It's just a singular person. But many of us, every domain, every project, everything that we're thinking about getting better in is within the framework of a team that can help you. Yeah, it's a great question. Bob, you had a question. Dr. Bob, you said that um, surgeons can show just like, like an athlete. So I'm yeah. curious. Do you want to repeat that? You said that surgeons can show just like an athlete can. But I'm curious if you could explain that because it's not like you have a stadium with 40,000 people watching. You have a staff that's subordinate to you. You're the one in charge. So how, how does that translate to show? Well, that, that's a brilliant question. If you have. He's unconscious, so, so he doesn't know what you're doing. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. The question is, surgeons who are com in complete control that don't have the pressure of, say, a large stadium or something else, why would they feel the pressure to choke? Let me give you uh, an example. <clears throat> and I'll give you a personal example. Doing an operation, and it's at a facility that does not, it's not the hospital. And during that particular procedure, it is unusual to encounter bleeding. Something different about this particular patient, the way their blood vessels are, during the procedure, bleeding occurred. I don't just mean a little bleeding, like rapid bleeding. Like bleeding like the guy's gonna be dead in about five minutes if something's not done. And when the bleeding happens, you can't see anymore to control the bleeding. That necessitates immediate action to save that person's life. And there's nobody in the room, as you said, that'll, that you can just say, hey, can you fix this for me? <laughs> I need help right now. There's no blood products to transfuse the patient. There's not even what we call vascular instruments to manage it. So that required changing little portal incisions, little tiny minimally invasive to slash the incision to this big, pack it with about three beach towels worth of material to put pressure on the bleeding that you can't get because you can't see it. Get the team to understand that we're in a crisis mode so that everybody's paying attention, nobody leaves the room, that the anesthesiologist starts resuscitating the patient, which means pouring fluid, which is not blood, but saline and other fluid, so that they don't have a drop in blood pressure, alerting other people, like there may be surgeons around or other people, to get in the room to help, turn the music off, everybody gets focused, and then managing it. Uh, I actually wear a heart rate monitor when I operate now. The reason is I want to do everything that athletes do. Whatever they're doing to get better, that's what I want to do in the operating room. What they eat, I eat. I watch all these guys. I watch all the baseball players. I watch all the soccer players. How do they sleep? What do they drink? What do they do before the game? I stretch out the night before a game. So I wear a heart rate monitor in the operating room to check my own retrospective stress level during the surgery to see if there's variations in stress. 
and that was me. And I told you that, that that patient was fine, by the way. Instead, I had to tell him, and you know, instead of these two things, you had this thing, and um, so everything was fine like that. But it's just an example. There are other people in that situation that are not able to handle it. Panic, just freeze, like going down the chute skiing, and then explode. They just freeze, and you don't have time to manage it. So mistakes happen and when the consequence is high. So anyway, that, that's a, uh, we could talk about it more if you have any other follow-up questions to it. But anyway, if you think uh, surgeons are hanging out and uh, thinking in the back of their mind about you know, the game tonight and, and what's going to happen in the third inning, no way, man. Laser focused, you are in there, and there's zero tolerance for mistakes. And many of the features that we talked about with this in the beginning, counterfactual simulation, what would you do if? I've rehearsed many times what I would do if I encountered bleeding at that site and what I would do to manage it. So, and then that's intraoperative. There's sideline decisions that we make all the time too. What if the guy has a concussion and the player is cursing me out and wants to stay in the game because he doesn't think he has a concussion and it's a very important game and pressure is coming to allow this guy to play but you know that allowing this guy to play could cause permanent brain damage. And you got to act like that. So lots of pressure. Anyway, other questions? OK, fabulous. Thank oh, no, go ahead. Ken, you have one? One more question. Yeah, that's a great question. So ju just to repeat it, visualization is powerful. We talked a lot about how we apply it to physical tasks. What about non-physical tasks that are more interactions, maybe giving a presentation, things like that? How do you do visualization to do that? Well, maybe I'll just lead in and, and say it this way. Uh, I came from Purchase. You guys want to know what my life is like. I live two blocks away. <laughs> two blocks away. So convenient, right? Not really, because this morning I had to go to Purchase College and do training room for NYCFC, and we saw six guys that are injured and tuned them up a little bit for their training for today to get them ready for Saturday's game. So I drove from Westchester to here. And on the ride here, I turned off the radio, and I went through a couple of sample rehearsals of things that I would manage. Number one was, how was I going to get all these books over here? Things are heavy. Figure out how to do that. Number two was, how am I going to introduce myself and relate to everybody who is soccer enthusiastic? And I'm talking as a surgeon in, an, in a domain, in an area that they may not be familiar with. And how am I going to bring that together? So I went through a couple of samples in my mind while I was in the car. And the same way you can do it if you have to deal with, say, a difficult conversation. You've got to approach somebody, you've got to give them feedback because you don't like the work that they did or what happened, and it may be uncomfortable. Even the same way you do it with people you care about, relationships. How am I going to do it in a way that is um, not going to create distance, but is going to create a solution? And there's ways to role play what you think is going to happen and what you think the response is. And you say, OK, I didn't like that. I saw how that went. I'm going to try it again this way. So we do it in non-physical ways all the time the same way. Yeah. Let me put you on the spot. Who has the most skill on NYCFC? And as you watch soccer throughout the world, who has the most skill in the world on soccer? You know, that, that's a, um, that is a brilliant question. And I'll say it like in a way where if somebody asks me, hey, which one of your kids is the best? <laughs> I can only lose with that question. So I'll say it this way. There are ways that you can understand skill in each one of the different players. And in some ways, uh, we, we, and it's in the book, you can learn from each one of the people that you admire, whatever it is that they struck you with, whatever it is, if, whoa, I like the way he did that. I like the way he interacted with people after the game. I like the way he interacts with the coach. I like the way he handles pressure. I like the way he responds to a hard tackle. I like the way he responds when he loses the ball. I like the way he plays in bad weather. 
all those things, you do what's called reverse engineer them. You look at somebody who you think is great, and reverse engineering is a concept that you take it apart. If I want to know how this speaker works, take the lid off, and I look at the inside parts, and then I see what it's made of, and I reconstruct it. If you look at the people who you think are really phenomenal at certain things, like I think Pirlo's first touch on the ball is amazing. He gets an extra half second than maybe some other guys because his first touch gives him a little bit more time because he directs the ball in a position that allows him to have a little bit more time and then he has more appreciation of the field, something like that. Then that would mean if I'm going to want to achieve that as a player, I'm going to do what Pirlo does with that type of first touch. I got to master the first touch. And if it comes to say, hey, ball striking is incredible to me, and I look at David Villa, whose ball striking is amazing, and his shot percentage that is on target, not floating in, into the crowd, is better than somebody else, I'm going to practice techniques where I have extreme pressure, guys pulling my shirt off. I'm going to make handles on my shirt for people to pull me and disturb me while I'm striking, and I'm going to use that as my ability to get better. But if you're asking me who my uh, favorite player is, I've watched you play, and I'm going to say right now, you're my favorite player. What position did you play when you played? And who was the player that you studied when you were playing? Well, that's a, uh, that's a lovely question. So what position did I play, and who did I study when I was uh, playing? I'll say this. When I, uh, and, and I have a couple of friends here who also played soccer, and we've played together in certain capacities. Um, when I played soccer at college, I started playing as a defender. And I was a kid that grew up in Long Island, so I was an American-born kid. And in fact, my coach used to try and tweak me, and we'll have fun talking about it. He'd say, I can't believe you grew up in America with the way you play, trying to make me feel good. Because about 70% of the team grew up playing soccer in other countries that played at our university, Fazi being an example, So, uh, who played at Columbia. So I started playing in the back, but my ideal position would be a midfielder where I could uh, help with creation on the field. And, but